prepare ourselves for a pastoral uh, prayer, and after that, we have the church covenant by Reverend Anita Flower. Once you bow your heads with me as we prepare to approach the throne of grace. Plus, all the righteous God, our Father. It's once more, Lord, a few of your children gather at the house of prayer. Simply to say this morning, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for our slumber and sleep last night. We thank you, Lord, for the darling angel you dispatched around each and every one of our bedsides. We thank you, Lord, that early this morning, at a due hour, where you touched us with a divine finger of love, eyes open to a new day, a day we have not seen, nor will we see again. We realize that the blood was still running warm in our veins. We sat on the side of our bed and realized that we had a reasonable portion of life, health, and strength. And we began our day with prayer, but before the prayer, we simply said thank you for our rising this morning. We looked around, there was still a roof over our heads. Our family circle was still intact. We were able to dress ourselves and get in our various vehicles and make our way out to the house of prayer one more time. We realize it's not because we've lived so good. It's not because we've done so many glorious things in your name. But Lord, we realize it's just your grace and your mercy. We count ourselves among the land of the living. And our simple refrain this morning is simply, thank you. And as we come, we ask that you would bless this church in a special manner. Bless the pastor who stands in this sacred desk. Preach the word to us. Strengthen him where he's weak. Build him up where he's torn down. Bless all of the auxiliaries of this church. And not only this church, but every church whose door stands ajar in your name this morning. Ever mindful that there are those in hospital beds and nursing homes and just at home that we can't call all of their names. But you know who they are. You know where they are. We simply ask, Lord, that you would touch them in a mighty way this morning. Let them know that we are thinking about them this morning and we are lifting them up in prayer. Bless those who are bereaved this morning. Sister Holman and the loss of a mother. Those others whose name I cannot call. Comfort them in their time of bereavement. Let them understand that if they just lean and depend on you, they'll be able to make it through. Bless those that are sitting in this waiting congregation. Someone came to hear a word from the Lord. Bless the pastor as he preaches the word this morning that it may fall on good ground and someone may come and yield and say, I can't hold out much longer and give their life to Christ. And before I sit down, Lord, I ask that you would Continue to throw your loving arms of protection around this place we call the United States of America. Bless us, Lord, with whatever we stand in need of. Bless our servicemen who are in various and sundry country protecting the name of the United States of America. Bless them where they are and bless the families that are here waiting for their safe return. We thank you, Lord, for how you bless us. We thank you, Lord, for how you are blessing us right now. And we put our weak hands in your strong hand. 
and say thank you for how you're going to bless our tomorrows. And one day, Lord, one day, Lord, when I can't pray anymore, when I go into my closet, come out no more. Lord, at that hour, I simply want to hear you say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Save us all without the loss of one. That is your servant's prayer this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Just before uh, Reverend McClough comes, well, I guess Brother Stevens is up there now turning the air on because it is hot. Amen. Thank you. Let us prepare for our church covenant, and we would like to ask the following new members to come forward with the right hand of fellowship. Theotis Green and Nafisa Leverett, would you please come forward at this time if you're present. Theodis Green, come forward, please. Now, be so leverage, are you present? We will read the church covenant, the bold print marked for congregation that us all read together. Let's begin. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, we do now in the presence of God, angels in this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully, enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel throughout all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotion, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindreds and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive anger, to abstain from the sale and use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in speech, feeling and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. Humbly confessing our past sins, we pray for grace and strength to keep these our holy vows for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated, and let me explain to you what the conversation was about. Uh, Brother Green, when he joined the church, he joined on his Christian experience having been baptized. He finished his new member's class and now he wishes to change his uh, request for coming and wants to come as a candidate for baptism because it was such a long time since he was baptized. And so what we want to do is we want to receive him as a candidate for baptism so that next first Sunday we can baptize him and then give him the right hand of fellowship. Amen. Well, Pastor, I make a motion to request be granted. 
and he become a candidate for that church. Motion and second that uh, Brother Green's request be granted. He become a candidate for baptism. And you've heard that. Are you ready to vote? All in favor, say amen. amen. Holds it the same right. Dr. Deacon Kemp going to give you the right hand to welcome. Stand up, Sister Williams. See this lady before you leave today. And, and, and she will schedule you now for next first Sunday. So if nobody calls you, you will know at 7.15 next Sunday, fifth, first Sunday morning, you will be here and they will prepare you for baptism. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bobby, you wanna take off okay, Go with her now. Don't be there. Does the church say amen? I want to thank uh, Minister Tim for the pastor in prayer and our leaders, uh, Reverend, our leaders for, uh, for the church covenant. Now at this time, we have announcement official notes and our welcome to visitors.
the pastor, Dr. Simmons, staff minister, Reverend Williams, other ministers and evangelists in the pulpit, offices, members, and friends, good morning. This time I'll bring to you our morning announcements. The names of our sick and shut-in that appear in our church bulletin are continuously asking the prayers of the pastor and the entire church. We're also asking prayers for the following persons and or their families. Brother Jody Shivers, as he is in the Grove Manor Nursing Home on Grove Street in East Orange. Also for Councilwoman Alicia Holman, due to the passing of her mother, Mrs. Evelyn Holman in South Carolina. The wake will be this Friday evening, 7 p.m. at Bethel Baptist in Pineland, South Carolina. And the funeral will also be from Bethel on Saturday at 12 noon. Now, condolences may be sent to the Bethel Baptist Church, 2012 Gillison Branch Road in Pineland, South Carolina. Now, if you wish to send condolences to Sister Holman here, you can send them to Miss Alicia Holman, 615 North Grove Street in East Orange, 07017, or you may send them to Sister Holman in South Carolina at 658 Pine Street West in Barnesville, South Carolina, that's 29944. And I know I speak rather quickly, so if you need those addresses, please see me after service and I'll make a copy for you, amen? <coughs> now, a couple of Sundays ago, we <coughs> made some made an announcement about a pharmaceutical company, or pharmacy, rather, uh, it's called the CARE 911. Uh, nurses are available to answer questions, et cetera. If you are interested in this, I have the flyer and also a card which explains to you in detail, too much detail for me to read at this time, but it sounds like a really good program for those of us who are on medicines that are very, very expensive. We ask that you pick up one of these and apply it in the office after service, or better still, are given to the ushers and they will gladly hand them out to you, amen? Male course rehearsal tomorrow at 7 p.m. Thank you, Brother Jack Kemp. Women's Day Choir rehearsals will be held on Thursday, May 14th, Tuesday, May 19th, and Wednesday, May 27th, beginning at 7 p.m. on all of the before mentioned dates. Thank you, Minister Alita McLeod. All persons who ordered corsages and hand cream from Deacon and Susan Timms, your orders are ready for pickup in the Thomas O'Neill Annex after these services. Monday, May 4th at 7 p.m., Christian Fellowship, Christian Fellowship Missionary Baptist Association. Let me tell you, let me just apologize because I do not like to do acronyms when it has to do with anything Christian. So please, from now on, just write it out. I'm smart, but I have a lot to read thanks to my loving Abyssinian family. Amen? Amen. So if you write it out, I don't have to see it because here. You don't know what I was getting ready to say, so thank you, Jesus. Okay, so on Monday, May the 4th, they will be having their 20th annual commencement services here at Abyssinian. Now, among the graduates are 12 Abyssinian members, and they are Trustee Cheryl Crawford, Deacon James E. Clark, Deacon S. Dorothy Clark, Sister Linda Cannon, Sister Joyce Joseph, Sister Frances Wynn, Brother Joseph Flagg, Sister Betty Tyson, Sister Mary Hines, Trustee Minnie Barfield, Sister Joanne Shannon, and Sister Giovanna Comer, and we want to congratulate them on their achievement in Christian education, amen. <laughs> Christian Fellowship Recognition and Scholarship Luncheon held May 16th at the Gallatin Hill Cavers, our honoree is Sister Bernice Powell. All tickets, patrons, and ad money is due today. Please see Sister Natalie Brown to complete payment. Also, we're asking all women to donate $1 to purchase the full page ad in honor of Sister Powell. Please see Deaconess Classy Hutchinson or our First Lady, Sister Emma P. Simmons, to contribute your $1. And men, we would like a dollar from you also. Please feel free to give. Amen? Thank you. That's from Sister Simmons. I added the last part. Saturday, May 16th. As I said, we're honoring Sister Bernice Powell, and the donation for the tickets for that affair is $60. You may also see Sister Simmons or Sister Natalie Brown for tickets. Now, you have an announcement in your bulletin that should not be there. Friday, May 29th through Saturday, May 30th, Women's Conference, that's an error, so please omit that or just ignore that. 
Sunday, May 31st, the Women of Abyssinia will celebrate our annual day during the 7.30 and 10.30 a.m. services. The 7.30 a.m. speaker will be the Reverend Sheila Thorpe, Assistant Pastor, Shiloh Baptist Church in Plainfield, New Jersey. At 10.30 a.m., Dr. Gwendolyn Young, First Lady, Silas First Baptist Church of Severna Park, Maryland. Immediately following these announcements, but before the welcome to visitors, Trustee Lyndon Brown will come to us. Briefly, we thank you for last Sunday's financial report. That concludes our morning announcements. And also, I'd just like to apologize to Brother Green. He was like, oh, he was like, does it take all of this? And I had to explain to him, yes, because we keep records in the church. And in order for the records to be decent and in order, when we make an error, we must correct it in front of the church. Amen? And so that is what Pastor did on my behalf and everybody else. Good morning, Abyssinian. Uh, first, let me announce the rehearsal for tomorrow will be canceled for the Bell Boards. Uh, I come on behalf of the Men's Day Committee. I just want to thank everyone who helped to make our Men's Day a huge success on last Sunday. We want to thank the Women's Ministry for your support um, and for, uh, serving refreshments and serving as readers for us. I want to thank all the men who participated on our program. And for those men who have not paid their $150 assessment, uh, you still have time. Um, and also, I want to again congratulate our honorees, um, our 2015 Man of the Year, Dick and Derek Spencer, and our other honorees. We want to just you know, let you know that we're very proud of you to have you in our men's ministry. Uh, our preliminary financial report is $8,030, for which we kindly thank you for. To God be glory. One other thank you, um, Deacon Brian Wilkins, would you please stand? We thank you, and I thanked uh, Sister Pat Harris earlier this morning for them filling in for me and Deacon S. Classy Hutchinson while we went to South Carolina. It's good to have Ram and Bush. So thank you so much. God bless. Good morning, church. We want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the Junior Mission, Sister Clark, and all that worked with her during the mission for the luncheon yesterday. We had a wonderful time and we had a nice participation. Now it takes a lot of time and effort to do what Mrs. Clark and her group does for to prepare us to go from here out on one to, to the uh, luncheon place. And I don't know about you, but I appreciate them taking the time to make this available for our seniors. The meals were great. The children act very nice. And again, on behalf of the church and the pastor center, we thank you. Continue the good work. Good morning. Good morning. Stand up, Brother Graves, and I always like to have this fellow stand because he's always doing some good stuff. During Men's Day, he put the wrong envelope in for his Men's Day assessment, and that envelope only had $10 in it. Well, this morning, he came in my office and gave me the real envelope with $150 in it for Men's Day. Amen. And uh, Brother Linda, you add that to the 8,000 something you got, and and I wanted you can see I wanted to say that you can have I wanted to say that because there are some other men who might not have had your whole hundred and fifty dollars. You can make another installment. You have from now until you know the Sunday before Women's Day to help you know pay all of your money. Amen. Now, whoever is cooking breakfast for the fifth Sunday, whoever's in charge of breakfast, I need you to uh, get in touch with me anytime after today. Because today in Cairo, Georgia, there's going to be a meeting. And uh, the class of 66 and 67 from Washington High School, that's the high school I graduated from, they are going to spend their class reunion in New Jersey. 
and they want to fellowship in Abyssinia that day. And so we want to make sure that we know how many are coming so that uh, uh, we can have enough, you know, breakfast to serve them and then there's a committee that's going to do a little something for them afterwards. Amen? And, and so um, whoever's preparing breakfast, uh, call me anytime after this afternoon because they're having a, a class meeting this afternoon and they have all of the particulars. Amen? Also want to thank those of you who went to the uh, United Missionary Baptist State Convention on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I understand that Abyssinia represented well, and, and I want to thank you uh, so much for that. Amen. Uh, asking your continued prayers for the Holman family and the death of, of her mother, and uh, just keep them on your prayer list. Amen. Amen. Also, we want to again reiterate that there will be no male course rehearsal tomorrow. In the sanctuary, graduation will be taking place. Commencement for the classes that have been taking place, taking place are sponsored by Christian Fellowship Missionary Baptist Association. Downstairs, uh, there will be a meeting uh, with the uh, U.S. Uh, Attorney General's Office, uh, the, the people who are going to have oversight of the Newark Police Department. They're going to be meeting downstairs to give you an idea of what they will be doing and how they will be doing. That meeting will be at 6 o'clock, and you're welcome to come and take part in that meeting. Amen? Uh, this is the day the Lord has made, and we, we're going to rejoice, and we're going to be glad in it. I want you to pray for my ushers. They boarded a bus this morning, and they uh, should be in Baltimore by now in worship service and wanted to pray for them because before, you know, we uh, concluded that they were going, we had to make some calls Amen. to Baltimore yeah. to make sure that that part of town where they're going to be, they will be safe. Amen. And so the president of the Usher's board there assured us that that part of town would be safe for my folk to come. Amen? Amen. Well, let's just pray for them while they are there uh, because, you know, some men might, you know, be there for good reasons and others might be there for other reasons. So we have to pray one for another. I was praying one Sunday and I was praying real hard for my enemies. And after church, Aunt Lillian said, you better save some of those prayers for your friends. <laughs> so our ushers are our friends and we are praying for them that God will keep them. Amen. Also, again, I'm sorry, Sister Clark, I couldn't make it to the grandparents' lunch, and I, 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 I had all in my mind to be there. I told my wife before I left Georgia, flying here, when we get off the plane, we're going to the grandparents' luncheon. But uh, my mind was there, but my body just, just couldn't make it. And so uh, I'm glad that y'all had a great time. And God bless you and keep you up. Let the church say amen. Now we're ready to go into another level. We're going to now hear from our music ministry from the Saint Choir. And after that, we hear a word from our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Perry Sidney. A word from the Lord.
For it was in Samaria that Jesus had to fulfill his divine assignment. Now, now the reason why the disciples wanted Jesus to go another way was because of the age-old racial feud that had existed between the Jews and the Samaritans for centuries. For you see, back during the days of the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonians robbed Jerusalem of its best productive minds. That they took from Jerusalem the best doctors, the best lawyers, the best teachers, the best singers, the best philo philosophers, the best scribes, and the sages. It kind of reminds me of what happened after we defeated the Germans, the Americans, and the Russians rushed, rushed into Germany to get the best minds and the best scientists. The Babylonians left in Jerusalem the weaklings and the retarded, the handicapped, the diseased, and the ill deformed. They only wanted to carry into exile those Jews that were strong, those who was, who was able to labor and could sing and also serve. The weak, the feeble, and the feverish Jews were left in Jerusalem. Those Jews that were carried into exile into Babylon, though they were captives and slaves in the heathen and, and polytheistic environment, they somehow managed to keep their bloodstream pure. For they remain pure Jews. But the Jews that were weaklings and remained in, in Jerusalem, some began mixing and mingling and intermarrying with their neighbors and surrounding communities. Now, now, when the Persians came and the Persian Empire under the kingship of King Cyrus captured the Babylonian Empire, one, among the first mandates of King Cyrus was that the Jews could go be free and allowed to go back to their homeland in Jerusalem. But when the Jews returned to their homeland, they found out that the Jews there were no longer pure, but they had begun to marry and to intermarry, and thus they became known as the Samaritans. So for this reason, when Jesus and his disciples got to, to the borders of Samaria, the disciples suggested to Jesus that they go another way. Why? Because they knew that because of the racial differences that existed between Jews and Samaritans, they wouldn't be received with hospitality. But Jesus had his disciples understand that though they are, that there were racial barriers, though they, they were hated, though their lives were in danger, he said, I must need go through Samaria. Now, now, the disciples couldn't understand how it was that Jesus just had to go through Samaria because they were not a part of the, the divine appointment. And, and brothers and sisters, if you are not a part of God's divine appointment, sometimes you just don't understand. Why is it that those who are have to do what it is that they have to do? And, and right here in this church, I've got some, some members who for the life of themselves just cannot understand that, that as pastor, sometimes I do some things because I need to do them. I say some things because they need to be said. Huh? I, I move some people because they need to be moved. I preach some sermon because even though they are offensive to somebody, they just have to be preached. Because you see, when you are under divine inspiration, you cannot ignore divine need. And some of us are so busy, you know, trying to do stuff until we have not even consulted God about what it is that God wants done. So Jesus said to his disciples, now y'all go the other route if you want to, but I must need go through Samaria. Well, let us see what happened when Jesus met a woman. Let's examine the situation when Jesus in a Samaria in the town of Sankar. He, he, it was a chance of 
uh, a change rather, or a chance or opportunity as Jesus sat on the well of Jacob. Had the woman come a few minutes earlier, she would have found that the, she would have found the disciples there and there wouldn't have been no interview between her and Jesus. Yeah. And, and had she come at the ninth hour and the third hour instead of the twelfth hour, Jesus would have been far on his way. But in the appointment of God, she came at the sixth hour at high noon when Christ was alone, tired, thirsty, and sitting on a well. This was no accident, brothers and sisters. She chose this hour because she thought the well would be deserted. She didn't want to go there when others were there. She wanted to go by herself. But she went to the well that day at that hour because God's hour had struck when she was to meet the Savior. I, I know you thought it was by happenstance and by accident that you came to the Lord when you did, but let me tell you, all you were doing was operating in the timing of God. Believe me when I tell you, I, our moments are overruled by divine providence. Sometimes you can plan one thing and God will make plans over your plan. Sometimes you can decide to go to one place and God will send you around another place. Why? Because I It was no accident that the Egyptians were passing by when Joseph's brother had made up their mind to kill him. It, it was no accident when Pharaoh's sister went down to the river to take a bath and find Moses floating in a basket. It was no accident that at the very time the Ethiopian was riding in his chariot that he met Philip and Philip taught him and ultimately baptized him. So then here was Jesus, resting and sitting on Jacob's well at the sixth hour that he sees a woman coming to the well. She's not young, but yet she's not old. She had grace and charm in her person, and as she balanced the water pots on her head, in her face and, and, and person had, had to be beauty because no woman could have attracted as many men as she did without some beauty and charm. But this woman also had a look of sadness and a look of weariness and disillusionment in, 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 in her face from, from, from I, I guess what she had gone through in life. The soul that looked out of her eyes is no longer expecting, no longer hoping for anything new, anything better, or anything different. She had been in that situation for such a long time, she wasn't looking to change. And you know, this is, it is always, that's always a sad state to get in. When you stop looking forward to anything, when you no longer look forward to hope, when you are in a sad condition, that was the case of this woman at the well. Let's look, if you please, at the moral status of this woman that Jesus is about to talk to. He might as well face it. Had it been you or me, I doubt if any of us would launch an evangelistic campaign with a woman of this caliber. And none, none of us would, would get in our car and, and ride to Irvington or any other city and say, I want to have a revival and I want to start it out with all the prostitutes in town. This woman was a peace breaker and a home wrecker. She was, she, she was an opportunist. She, she was indiscreet, conceited, oversexed. Radical and selfish. She was immoral, inconsiderate. But in spite of that, she had really wrongly looked at Jesus. But Jesus had looked beyond her faults and saw 
her knees. Man, I told you she's immoral and considerate, opportunist, but Jesus looked beyond all of that. Oh, how tragic it would have been if Jesus had said, because of your record, I can't talk to you. I can't use you. I'm going somewhere with this. The whole time would have been lost if Jesus had said, that woman won't do. But the difference between us and Jesus is that we are a bunch of look at us and Jesus is a look beyond that. Yeah, you look at their drug use, you look at their alcohol use, you look at the fact that they are an adulterer. But Jesus looked beyond their faults, he looked beyond their weaknesses, he looked beyond their sins. And then as, as this woman drawn near to the well, she came along, and Jesus took the time for just one somebody. Wasn't nobody there with him? Huh? It was, you know, he'd been used to talking to thousands. But he took the time of, to, to talk to one somebody. Too many of us have this, this hangover about crowds. Huh? But that's not being like Jesus, because Jesus always took time for just one somebody. To one Zacchaeus who climbed up a sycamore tree, Jesus said, come down. I will abide at your house today. To one young man who had been laying at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, Jesus said to him, take up your bed and walk. He went down to one man's house named Jarius and raised his one daughter from the dead. That's one somebody. And one day Jesus stopped along the, the, the roadside and opened the eyes of one blind man. And to just one Nicodemus, Jesus made the most powerful statement that could have ever been made. And that is, you must be born again. Jesus always found time for just one somebody. And so thus we see Jesus in another one-on-one -on -one situation with this woman that he met at the way. But remember I told you, he met a woman and he asked her for something. So let's, let's deal with that part where after he had met her, huh? listen if you please, to the dialogue that is about to take place between Jesus and the woman at the well. He said, give me, I pray thee, a drink of water. Now this was obviously Jesus' way of approaching the woman. For water out of Jacob's well was not what Jesus really wanted. Huh? Because when Jesus was sitting on the well, it was nothing but a well sitting on the well. Remember now, Jesus had done without bread and water for 40 days and 40 nights. And it was only seven miles from Samaria to Jerusalem. And if Jesus could go 40 days and 40 nights without bread and water, surely he could go seven miles and not be thirsty. And so when Jesus asked her for water, it could not have been what he wanted because he was a well of water. That bubbling up unto everlasting joy. He who is with his father calls it to rain 40 days and 40 nights. Why would he have to ask for what? All he had to do was just say rain. Huh? After all, at the wedding feast, when the wine ran out, ran out, he took water and made it into wine. So, so it wasn't because he was thirsty. Yeah, he didn't want what was in the well because he himself put it in the well. But as a way of striking up a conversation with this woman, Jesus said, give me a drink of water. The woman responded to Jesus by saying, how is it that thou being a Jew, ask me a Samaritan for a drink of water? Now immediately this woman brought race into it. And isn't it strange how you can have a conversation about anything and all of a sudden race has got to come up? 
Huh? So she said, now how is it that you being a Jew? Ask me a Samaritan, or you, you know, drink of water. Where have you been, Jesus, all this time? Don't you know that Jews don't have anything to do with Samaritans? Don't you know that, that, that all of y'all think that y'all are better than us? But Jesus said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that asked you for a drink of water, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. How often opportunities meets us, speak to us, pleads with us, tarry with us for a while, but then because we don't recognize it, it departs from us. That's a blessing God has brought to your door. And because you didn't recognize it, he took it away. Can I get a witness? Many of us didn't know opportunity when it knocked on our door because we had already told God what we wanted. Huh? We told God, God, I'm tired of walking, and I want you to give me a BMW. If God sends a Chevrolet, you send the Chevrolet back because that ain't what you asked for. Just think about it. If you knew how close God comes to us, in his providence. And in that joy that almost lifted you up to the sky, in that sorrow that almost plunged you beneath the earth, in that fears and punches when it approached you for some transfer, transformation or transgression, in, in that whisper of the Holy Spirit which called you to a higher life. Because we didn't recognize it. It just passed us by. In that woman, who loved to care for you while you were looking beyond her and somebody else. And that man who provided for his family, huh? Those lost opportunities. But listen to Jesus. Jesus said, woman, let me tell you something. If you had just a little insight, if you had the remotest suspicion, if you had the slightest idea to whom you were talking, you would have entirely, you would have an entirely different attitude. If you only knew that I was Daniel Stone, if you only knew that I was Ezekiel's wheel, if you only knew that I was Jeremiah's fire, you would have asked me for water. But the woman said, how are you going to give me a drink of water when you don't have anything to draw with? And she said, and the well is deep. <laughs> so where are you going to get your living water from? She said, our father Jacob gave us this well. And we've been feeding our cattle. And we've been drinking from it. Huh? And our children and, and all our cattle drink from it. Uh, are you better than our father Jacob? But Jesus said to the woman, he said, now whosoever shall drink of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. That's true of all water. Did you know that? No matter how much water you drink, guess what? You're going to thirst again. Huh? Even of all things of life, we, we thirst again. I don't care how much or what you have in life. Guess what? You want some more. You got a house, you want two houses. You got money, you want more money. Say it ain't somebody. We, we drink here today and, and, and there tomorrow, like the woman at the well, we got to return again and again. Because our vessels are empty. Out of all the pleasure, we have in this life, there are still some pleasures that life can't offer. So it leaves us thirsty. Out of all of the achievements in life, I don't care what you achieve, there are still some achievements that you will not reach. So you're going to still be thirsty. There's nothing in this world to satisfy the soul that, and those who try to get out of this world what they need to satisfy their souls, guess what? They come up thirsty. I know you thought drugs could do it. 
And now you use every kind of drug there is and you still thirsty. You drink everything they can put in the bottle with alcohol in it, and guess what? You still thirsty. You run to every bar, you sit on every bar stool, and guess what? You are still thirsty. But Jesus said, if, if you had just asked me, and I would have given you living water. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He even sent for the queen of Sheba. And when she left, she said, the hand had never been told. But guess what the conclusion was? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. So, so Jesus is saying, lady, I, I didn't, don't, don't need your water pot. Because you're talking about one kind of water. And I'm talking about another kind of water. Yeah, I'm talking about the water of salvation, grace, and everlasting life. You can drink your own water, but if you drink of the water I'm talking about, you will never thirst again. So the lady said, all right, sir, you convinced me. I don't know who you are, but give me this water that I may drink and thirst not. In other words, what she said is, I don't want to come to this well and draw no more. But then Jesus made a request to awaken her conscience. Huh? He said to her, call your husband. He met her, asked her for some water, and at the end, he says, go call your husband and come here. In other words, don't send him. You come back with him. Can you get a witness? And so what that necessitated her to do was to go downtown and tell him. You see, it costs all of us something to be in the fellowship of Christ and receive the greatest gift. And that something is the part with every sin in your life. If you're going to be with Jesus, you got to give up some stuff. Can you get a witness? Jesus said to the woman at the well, go call your husband. Now, to, to some of y'all, he might say, go call your wife. To another, he might say, go call those things you need to neglect. To another, he might say, go call your mama. And you're there. And some of y'all's God is your bank book, so he said, go call your bank book. Mm, I know you thought I wasn't going there. It troubles you every time somebody said, bring all your tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, because you got trouble with your bank book. You got trouble with your pocket. So to you, he might be saying, go get your bank book. To another, he might be saying, go and call the records of that business deal you made where you didn't treat that person fairly. Mm -hmm. To another, he might say, go and call that secret habit, mm -hmm. which strains and defiles your soul. You, you know that thing that won't let you worship, because you wondered if anybody knew about it but you. Yeah. He said, go and call it. Yeah. But this woman, to, to this woman, Jesus said, go call thy husband. And to try to cover up her sin, she said, I don't have no husband. And Jesus said, you have well said because you had five husbands. And the one that you're with now is not yours. Now, brothers and sisters, this shows right here that Jesus was a divine, or Jesus had his divine appointment because Jesus knew all of her history. Without going down to the courthouse to check the records, he knew she had five husbands and the one she was with was not her. Without looking at the birth certificate, without, without first talking to her kinfolk, without asking about her house, Jesus knew she was living with a man that wasn't hers. Now, I'm afraid today that Jesus needs to walk up and down the aisles of every church get in between every pew and tell let me just deal with the women first some of you sisters 
who are painted up and dressed up, made up, combed up, wrapped up, tied up, tangled up, and tell you that the man that you have ain't yours. He, he, he may have wined and dined you last night. He may have huffed and puffed and laid and played, but the Lord told me to tell you, he ain't yours. I know some of y'all can't wait till the benediction is given so, so you can get home and get that phone call from that one that's not yours. So before you start looking down on this woman in the tent, you better take a look at yourself. Just because you march down the aisle and say, I do, doesn't mean he's yours. There you are. You, 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 you have a if you're at home waiting on grocery money and he won't even come home and you say he's yours. You can't even get him to buy you a sweater and he's already at feminine conferred buying that other woman a mint and you say he's yours. You riding the bus and he just brought her a car. <laughs> and he says, he's yours. Now the Lord said, those who I have put together, let no man put asunder. But some of y'all that said that God put together, y'all just got together. And if all you did was just got together, the one you're with ain't yours. Don't worry, man, your day coming. Jesus knew that she was living in adultery, but he wanted her to admit it. That's what the Lord wants us to do. The Bible says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And the only way you can be saved is to confess that you are a sinner. And after she had confessed her sin, Jesus said, lady, you were right. You don't have a husband because you had five and the one that you are shacking with is not yours. In other words, Jesus said, your bedroom has been the temporary stop-off place for five men. But at least you had the decency to go down time to get married. But now you are living with one that's not yours. What are you talking about, Jesus? Somebody else's man is hanging their coat in your closet. Someone else's man is eating at your table. Someone else's man is sleeping in your bed. And at this time, she changed the conversation. And she says, I perceive that thou art a prophet. I follow worship in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place we all worship. Now, all of a sudden, she's gone from there to worship. But Jesus told us, and later, you mixed up on this thing called worship. For you are more concerned with the place than you are with the motive. You are concerned about where you ought to be and, and, uh, rather than being concerned about how. Because true worship has nothing to do with geography, but God does not dwell in Mount Zion. God is a spirit. And if you're going to worship him, you've got to worship him in spirit and in truth. Because those are the people that God seeks to worship him. But the woman said, well, I'm have to go on like I'm doing because you see, we are expecting a savior. We're looking for a redeemer. For all the prophets talked about the king who would come and set up his kingdom. That, that, that's who I'm waiting for because he's going to make the rough places smooth and, and the crooked places straight. The one I'm looking for is going to exalt the valleys and he's going to lower down the hills and mountains. But Jesus said to her, the Messiah is already here. How do you think about, I know about your past? How do you think I know about your the true worship? Woman, you are speaking to the Messiah. And while Jesus was, was speaking, 
something started happening in her. She, she, she opened up her heart and living water started flowing in and prejudice started flowing out. She opened up her very soul and grace started flowing in and immorality started flowing out. She, she got a new outlook on life, but she had a new talking, a new walking, and new ideas, new inspirations and aspirations. All things for her had become new. And brothers and sisters, the same thing will happen to you when you have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your trouble. So the Bible says she left her water pots behind because her water pots represented her past life. That water pot she left behind represented racism and fornication and adultery and prejudice and selfish pride. It represented all her entire life of sin. But when she met Jesus, when, when she met the man from Galilee, she got her cup filled up. Guess what? She left her past life behind. And I didn't come so much this morning to bring up that woman's past life. What I came to bring up is the fact that she, when she met Jesus, she left that past life behind. And that makes me wonder about people who say they have met Jesus. They say they've been born again. They say they've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, but they still carry in the same old water pots. Yeah, they say they're saved, but they're still evil. Still mean. I don't know what it is about church folk. It's got to be so mean. But I'm here to tell you today that if you really know Jesus, you'll leave those water pots behind. You'll find yourself singing, what a wonderful change has been wrought in my life since Jesus came into my heart. Yeah, floods of joy all my soul like a sea pillar's road. Says Jesus came into my heart. So it was when Jesus got all down in this woman's heart, she left her water pots and, 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 and began running in the town. Remember I told you he met a woman, asked her for something. She went downtown and told me. So when she got downtown, she said, come see a man. Not a white man, not a black man, not a Samaritan man, not a Jew man, but, but, but a God sent me. Come see the man. They told me all. Ever I have done. She ran, told everybody. Come see a man. She ran and told the carpenter. Put down your hammer and nails. For I just found the open door. She ran and told the shepherd boy and said, put down your rod and staff, for I just found the good shepherd. She ran and found the house builder and said, put down your tools, for I just found the shelter in the time of a storm. She ran into town and told the undertaker, put down your embalming fluid, because I just met the resurrection and the life. She ran and told the baker to put down your pen and dough, for I just found the bread of life. She ran and told the grocery man to put down all of his grocery, for I just found a man whose bread when you get hungry. She ran down to the light company and told I just found a man who is the light of the world. She ran down to the schoolyard and told the students, I just found the answer to all of your questions. She told the chemist, I just found a man who can turn water to wine. And I believe she broke out in a song and said, my soul is a witness for my
You 